Kongressveranstaltungen, da wir uns entschieden haben, nur 270 Stühle zu bringen, da wir nicht vor leerem Saal äh, sitzen wollten und jetzt sind wir wirklich außerordentlich überwältigt von diesem Ansturm. Vor allen Dingen, dass auch so viele so junge Menschen hier sind. Ich würde mir wünschen, dass sie alle auch noch in unsere wunderschöne Aufstellung von Klaas Oldenburg kommen würden, die nur noch bis am Montag läuft und die in der Tat sehenswert ist. Cher Monsieur Rancière, äh, Cher Madame Rancière, es ist uns eine große Freude und auch eine Ehre, dass Jacques Rancière heute hier in den Mummerkopfstallungen anlässlich des 25. Jubiläums des Passagenverlags seinen Festvortrag hält. Ich darf Jacques Rancière, einen der wohl bedeutendsten Philosophen der Gegenwart, ganz herzlich begrüßen der mit seinen Schriften zum Verhältnis von Ästhetik und Politik für die Kunst und ihren Diskurs ganz Grundlegendes und Wegweisendes geleistet, und geleistet hat und weiterhin auch leistet. Monsieur, Monsieur, bienvenue au Moumoc. Je suis très heureuse que vous nous visitez au Moumoc pour la deuxième fois avec la maison d'édition Passage der Lage. Merci beaucoup. Wir sind sehr stolz. Wir sind sehr stolz darauf, dass uns der Passagenverlag diese Kooperation angeboten hat. Ich möchte an dieser Stelle Herrn Engelmann ganz herzlich begrüßen, den Gründer des Passagenverlags. Ich möchte Ihnen nicht nur zum 25. Jubiläum Ihres Verlages danken, sondern ich möchte Ihnen ganz, ganz, ganz herzlich zu Ihrem runden Geburtstag gratulieren, nachträglich, der am 30. April stattgefunden hat. Jetzt ein ganz großer Applaus für Peter Engelmann.
Diese Veranstaltung wurde dankenswerterweise auch vom französischen Kulturinstitut unterstützt und ich möchte an dieser Stelle ganz herzlich Guillaume Rousson begrüßen, der Leiter des Instituts Français Autriche. Herzlich willkommen hier in Munich. Mein ganz besonderer Dank geht auch Frau Pichler, die von Seiten des Verlages diese Veranstaltung gemeinsam mit unserer Eventmanagerin Katharina Rathmacher, der ich auch ganz herzlich danken möchte, organisiert hat. Ja, herzlich willkommen, ich wünsche Ihnen nun einen wunderbaren Abend. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Herzlich begrüßen äh, zu dieser Veranstaltung, die wir gemeinsam mit dem Moonwalk durchführen dürfen. Äh, ich habe eine lange Dankesliste. Ähm, zuerst und, äh, besonders herzlich möchte ich Frau äh, Dr. Kraus danken, die diese Veranstaltung möglich gemacht hat, die diese Kooperation mit dem Moonwalk, die wir seit einigen Jahren pflegen, äh, fortsetzt und fortsetzen will, wie sie mir gerade sagte. Allerdings hat sie mich jetzt ein bisschen überrascht mit diesem Geburtstagsgruß. Das wollte ich gar nicht. Das ist ein negativer Punkt. Die, äh, ich äh, danke auch Herrn äh, Dr. Fuchs, äh, den Stellvertreter, glaube ich, und Frau Dr. Krause, äh, den die Mitarbeitern des Nubooks, und des Passagenverlages, dem Französischen Kulturinstitut, äh, Frau Dr. Militscher für die Übersetzung, äh, die sie freundlicherweise hier für die Diskussion dann vorgelegt wird. Und äh, last but not least natürlich Jacques Rancière, der äh, trotz seines dichten Terminkalenders äh, heute äh, für zwei Tage nach Wien gekommen ist, äh, sozusagen als, als äh, Geburtstagsgeschenk. Das freut uns ganz besonders. Der diesjährige Anlass, also einerseits haben wir diese alte, oder schon langjährige Kooperation mit dem Nur, aber wir haben einen Anlass, der stand vorhin da vorne dran, 25 Jahre Passagen, aus der, in dem sich diese Veranstaltung auch einleitet. Wir, haben, wir führen in Wien, Berlin, Budapest und oder auch New York. Veranstaltungen durch Gespräche mit unseren Autoren, wo wir die Idee davon ist, dass wir ein anderes Medium als das Buch wählen, um unsere Ideen, unsere Fragen zu diskutieren und damit Einblick geben in, unsere, in die Werkstatt des Passagenverlages und natürlich auch in das, was uns eigentlich motiviert, so was 25 Jahre lang zu tun. Gäste dieser Veranstaltung ist neben Jacques Rancière, äh, Alain Badiou und Mihail Weider in Wien, Mihail Weider und Chandor Ratnotti in Budapest, Peter Eisenmann und Caroline Heinrich in New York, Kooperationspartner des NUMO, die Kulturinstitute in Budapest und New York, das Deutsche Haus, die Villa Gelee in Lyon und so weiter. Das übergreifende Thema dieser Veranstaltung ist Krisenszenarien, hat die Philosophie, hat die Kunst, eine Antwort äh, in dieser gesellschaftlichen Krise. Wir fragen nach den aktuellen Positionen der Philosophie, der Kunst in, wirtschaftlichen, in den wirtschaftlichen, sozialen und gesellschaftlichen Krisen der Gegenwart. Unser heutiger Gast Jacques Rancière steht in der gegenwärtigen Diskussion um die Rolle der Philosophie und der Kunst eine hervorragende und zentrale Rolle. Er ist sicher einer der einer der bedeutendsten Denker des beginnenden 21. Jahrhunderts. Für mich ist er schon länger, schon seit dem 20. Jahrhundert ein bedeutender Denker, denn er ist eigentlich dafür verantwortlich, dass ich in Frankreich sein konnte. Als Student in den 70er Jahren habe ich einen französischen Professor gebraucht, der mir was schreibt, damit ich ein Stipendium bekomme. Und dieses Gutachten über meine Arbeit und mein Projekt hat ich auch noch sehr geschrieben. Äh, ich glaube, wir reden, von, äh, wir reden schon von vor langer Zeit. Und äh, mit diesem Gutachten konnte ich in 
Paris bleiben, konnte dort studieren, konnte mich mit der französischen Philosophie befassen, konnte äh, alle Leute kennenlernen, die damals, äh, die damals Autoren geworden sind. Und in dem Sinne äh, ist er tatsächlich äh, auch äh, ganz pragmatisch, äh, eigentlich äh, an der Wiege, steht da an der Wiege auch des Passagenverlages. Weil ohne diese Zeit in Paris, die er ermöglicht hat, hätte ich, äh, wäre ich sicher nicht auf die Idee gekommen, dieses Projekt zu starten und hätte auch gar nicht die Mittel gehabt, die Möglichkeiten. Äh, Jacques Concierge, äh, wir haben uns dann ein wenig aus den Augen verloren, weil ich war mehr an sprachphilosophischen Fragen interessiert. Äh, Jacques Concierge war eher ein politischer Autor. Er äh, ist äh, zum ersten Mal äh, sehr berühmt geworden durch seine Mitarbeit äh, bei, äh, an dem Nier de Capital, äh, von Althusser und Pierre Balibar, seinen Lehrern. Äh, dieses Buch äh, hat einen theoretischen Antihumanismus äh, äh, propagiert, äh, der die äh, der gestaltende Kraft hatte, mehr als die subjektiven äh, äh, Momente. Er hat diese Strukturen gegenüber den subjektiven Momenten äh, äh, absolutiert und Jacques Concierge hat sich äh, sofort dann äh, dagegen gewandt äh, und hat, äh, ist dann wiederum berühmt geworden durch seine Anti-Artissier-Position. Äh, äh, also wir reden von den 60er und 70er Jahren, wo äh, die Fragen des Marxismus und seiner Interpretation tatsächlich äh, für jeden Intellektuellen, äh, der nicht gerade vor Konservativismus erstarrt ist, äh, die entscheidenden Fragen waren. Übrigens, äh, äh, wie wir wissen oder wie wir sehen können, wiederholen sich diese Fragestellungen heute. Es gibt die Denker, die von einer Rückkehr des Kommunismus reden. Ein merkwürdiges Phänomen, wenn man daran denkt, was der realisierte Kommunismus verbracht hat. Aber da ist das Argument, dass es eben keine, dass es die Ideen von Marx nicht wirklich realisiert hat, sondern dass es da eben hohe Abweichungen gab aufgrund historischer Umstände. Also all diese Fragen, die damals in den 70er, 60er, 70er Jahren diskutiert wurden, sind heute wieder äh, aktuell. Warum? Es ist klar, weil die gesellschaftliche Krise, äh, weil der Kapitalismus nach, der, äh, nach dem Ende des, des Widerparts äh, des, des sozialistischen Lagers äh, heute zu seiner eigenen Krise gefunden hat. Und äh, Lösungen äh, gibt es nicht, aber es gibt alle intellektuelle Anstrengungen ähm, und richtet sich mehr und mehr darauf, hier neue Antworten zu finden. Jacques Rancière ist ein Vorreiter äh, dieser Entwicklung. Er hat damals äh, nach der Kritik an dem strukturalen Geschichtskonzept von Louise Althusser äh, sich äh, den sozialen Bewegungen des 19. Jahrhunderts zugewandt und dieser erforscht eine sehr bedeutsame Arbeit, minutiöse Studien, äh, mit der Idee eben zu zeigen, wie das Volk selber, äh, wie die Menschen, äh, die, in diesen, äh, die, in diesen, die nicht oben sind und keine Führer, wie die eigentlich Geschichte machen, wie deren äh, Einfluss äh, oder wie deren Einfluss auf gesellschaftliche Entwicklung überhaupt aussieht oder aussehen kann. Also äh, ja, mit diesen Forschungen war er äh, nicht in der Hauptströmung der letzten 30 Jahre, äh, die er eher durch äh, Dekonstruktivismus und, und äh, Postmoderne gekennzeichnet waren. Äh, aber interessanterweise ist er heute wieder äh, daran gehabt. Äh, seine Forschungen waren im Gegensatz zu den sprachphilosophischen Überlegungen Derridas und zu den diskurstheoretischen Überlegungen Lyotas eher äh, an der Institution Analyse Foucaults äh, orientiert. Äh, heute, äh, also ein Passagenverlag, der ist jetzt ein also wieder Autor, ein Passagenverlag geworden oder ist Autor geworden, nachdem wir uns wiedergefunden haben, wir haben mittlerweile neun Bücher, glaube ich, und äh, einige äh, in Vorbereitung einerseits zur politischen Theorie, aber was Sie natürlich, oder was Sie vielleicht hier äh, mehr im Museum sehr interessiert, äh, 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 einige Bücher mittlerweile schon vier zu seinem äh, Schwerpunkt seit den 90er Jahren der ästhetischen Theorie. 
das ist in der Tat, äh, womit er sich jetzt auch äh, äh, gerne äh, äh, beschäftigt und dazu äh, wird er heute auch äh, äh, sprechen. Äh, Begriffe der Moderne und der Avantgarde in ihrer Beziehung zum Politischen. Er untersucht Kunst im Singular als historische Konfiguration und spezifische Form der Erfahrung. Im Anschluss an seinen Vortrag äh, wird er mit uns äh, diskutieren, können wir Fragen stellen. Wir, äh, dank äh, der Unterstützung von Paul Militscher können wir das auf Französisch und Deutsch tun. Äh, wir, es gibt auch einen Büchertisch, das man nicht vergessen, mit einem Sonderpreis. Und äh, Jacques Rancière signiert sogar Bücher dann im Anschluss, hat einmal die Gelegenheit, äh, sich einzudenken mit der Literatur. Äh, Jacques, äh, Art 
with a capital A doesn't exist. It doesn't exist because artists and art institutions distance themselves from the vulgar conditions of prosaic activity and class domination. It exists as a consequence of the redistribution of human activities and of their mode of visibility and thinkability. This must lead us to revise some notions belonging to the history of art and of its relation to politics, such as the notions of modernity and avant-garde. Those notions were destined to historicize the transformations within the field of art and their connection with political transformations. But if it turns out that art itself is a historically determined configuration of experience, and that the content of that historicity is a redistribution of the sensible, a reconfiguration of the relation between the forms and spheres of human activity, those notions must be rethought from that angle. The point is that the usual notions of modernity, avant-garde, and modernism are more or less predicated on a very simple and simplistic view of the action of time. Let us think, for instance, of the canonical analysis made by Clement Greenberg in Avant-garde and Kitsch, so in 1940. This analysis of the opposition of the two terms, avant-garde and kitsch, is in keeping with a view which has been dominant since the times of counter-revolution and romanticism, a view of modernity as a process of acceleration provoking the collapse of tradition. Modernity thus in this schema is given two main aspects. On the one hand, it means the disruption of the fabric of common beliefs and values linking the practice of the artists the content of their works and the expectations of their audience. As Greenberg puts it, quote, all the verities involved by religion, authority, tradition, style are thrown into question, and the writer or artist is no longer able to estimate the response of his audience to the symbols and reference with which he works, end quote. On the other hand, modernity in this, so this framework means a high-speed process of mechanization and industrialization which has two consequences. The first one is, um, so I'm, all, I'm, I'm still, of course, uh, following Greenberg. The first one is a principle, the process of fast urbanization of the rural masses. Those masses are severed from their traditional culture as we enter the world of literacy. But they are deprived, we say, of the leisure and comfort necessary for the enjoyment of the city's traditional culture. What they discover instead of leisure is thus a new capacity for boredom, which leads them to, quote, set up a pressure on society to provide them with a kind of culture seat for their own consumption, end of quote. That demand is precisely satisfied, thanks to the second aspect of the process of mechanization, the possibility of producing at high speed industrially made cultural products, such as tin pan alley music or popular magazines. In such an analysis, the question of time is viewed from a very restricted angle. Modernity only means a speeding up of time, and that speeding up provokes a split between two forms of activity. An activity whose aim, whose aim is to produce things for accelerated social consumption, industrial production, including cultural industry, and an activity which has no more any definite social aim and must consequently become an end in itself. In a way, I art has no other choice than to move forward without any end but its own preservation. But at the same time, this endless forward movement, which restages the opposition between those who move forward ahead of the time and those who lie back of it. It comes as no surprise that those responsible for the reign of the real world are the children of the backward class the children of patients forced to be drawn from, from their slow mode of living toward the use of time for which they have not the appropriate culture. Not incidentally, a huge part of Greenberg's demonstration is devoted to the characterization of Stalinist art as teach culture, the culture of the sons of peasants who recognize their image, the real world paintings of Rubin and of his imitators. Well, this analysis is a way of imposing an understanding of modernity against another, that which had been precisely embodied by the Soviet Revolution and by its artistic avant-garde. Modernity as the equation of artistic practice with the construction of the forms of a new life. 
Green Bay puts faith to this modernist dream with a simple dilemma, either the current place of high art or the universality of teach culture. But in order to do so, he has to reduce issues of temporality to a mere matter of moving forward or backward. He has to focus on time as quantity, while the main issue is about the quantity of time. That quality is at stake in the question of the capacity or incapacity of the sons of patients to enjoy leisure. But if he can do so, it is perhaps because the modern dream itself had always failed to isolate this qualitative aspect of time. It failed to isolate time as a category in the distribution of the sensible from time as a matter of old and new, slow and fast. Revisiting modernity for me means trying to restage time as a form of distribution of the sensible to see what problem it raised at the core of the modern history of coincidence and how those problems led to the triumph of the simplistic view of modernity which still prevails in the discussion of modernism and postmodernism. What forms of redistribution of the modes of human perception and human activity are at stake in the modernist will or the modernist dream of the 19th, of the 19th, 1910s, 1920s? What forms of temporality were at play in that redistribution? I tried to substantiate that investigation by commenting on an example borrowed from a historical sequence which emblematizes the forms of redistribution of the sensible that are at issue under the names of modernity and art. So we are, here are two posters. So this one and hopefully this is the other one. So no? Okay, that's fine. Okay. But two posters, so two posters made design in 1928 in by two Soviet artists, the Stenberg Brothers. They, they are made to advertise the film, which is itself emblematic of both a certain idea of cinema as an art of modernity and a certain idea of Soviet particle art as a form of art immediately equated with the construction of a new life. So this is, this is the Gabbard of film, known as Man with a Movie Camera. What we see on the poster is a Russian title, Chelovdes Kino Apparato, whose literal translation is man with a movement machine, an expression which has a slightly different resonance, as if behind the obvious visibility of the character, the cameraman, practicing a definite activity in cinema, we perceive the whole distribution of the sensible, affir affirming the convergence of a certain type of humanity with the activity of the movement and the use of the machine. Well, let us start with the most obvious fact about those two posters. Their distance from the normal way in which the characters and situations of the movie are normally illustrated. On both posters, we have the figuration of a female body. But that female body is not featured in the usual way of an object of desire. Nor is she a character exhibiting the signs of some feeling of emotion. She exists only as a performing body, even though to achieve her performance she needs to be divided into two parts. In two parts, a part performing the movement of dance and a part performing the art of scene. Clearly, these two performances, moving and seeing, are the moving and, see, and, and seeing are exactly the same as the performances of the machine itself. The posters liken the curve of the dancing legs to that of the cameraman bent over his machine and couple the eye of the woman with the eye of the machine. They tell the viewers that this film belongs to a new time. It is not a film telling a story with actors expressing the emotions and feelings and of fictional characters and urging spectators to identify with those characters and share their emotion. This is no more presentation. This is a direct performance of art, and what the poster displays is the means that this art sets to work. At first start, this opposition between representation and direct performance may seem to validate the idea of modern art as autonomous art, doing away with representation to explore the possibility of its own medium. 
but it soon appears that instead of confirming it, it changes the very idea of medium by making it no more the material and the support of a specific practice, but a global sensorium in which several practices become indistinct as they are referred to the same one and the same form of materiality and function. What the modernist paradigm the modernist paradigm of autonomous art based its argumentation on the distinction made by Lessing between the art of words and the art of visual form, the art of time and art of space. Here, this distinction is refuted in a quite aggressive way. On the second poster, not only, the part of the body and the letters giving the title of the film, so the second, giving the, giving the title of the title of the film and the name of the, the names of the of filmmaker, cameraman and editor. <coughs> Those, <coughs> so you know, so so those, so, so those, those words, those letters, you know, are combined so as to suggest at once the lens of a camera and the movement of a problem cleaving through the air, an image deeply cherished by Soviet artists, as is made evident, you know, by those drawings made by Barbara Stepanova to represent Charlie Chaplin as a hero of the time of the machine. Well, of course, um, so in most of words, visual, visual forms and movements are turned into the same dynamic reality. The poster constructs the sense of the movie in which an assemblage of written words is the same as a gesture of visual forms because both are manifestations of the same movement. On the surface of the poster, everything is moving and all the movements are homogeneous. Of course, neither the, film make, neither the filmmaker nor the designers of the posters have invented that coincidence. That convergence between the art of words, the art of forms and the art of movement had been for long at the core of the attempts of artistic novelty. In the 1890s, poets like Malarmé in search of a new poetic writing, saw the model of such a writing in the dance of Lloyd Fuller, a dance conceived no more as imitation of a story, but as a display of visual forms in space. In a similar way, the reformers of the theatre imagined an art in which words would only be, as Meyer Hall put it once, drawings of the framework of movements. Then to these painters like Braque or Picasso put the words of the newspaper on their canvases and futurist painters like Pocioni and Severini brought the surface of their canvases into innumerable facets in order to make them express the dynamism of modern life and popular <coughs> entertainment. But Soviet artists are in the best position to make us feel what is at, at issue in this privilege of movement. What, what is merging into a unique sensory fabric is not only the art of words and the art of forms, the art of time and the art of space, it's also the forms of art and the forms of collective life. An aesthetic revolution which is a political revolution as well. Now, the problem is how to characterize this revolution. What is this life which appears as a fabric within which the forms of art lose their separateness? Well, there is a well-known answer to that question. It, it is that answer emphasizes that words, forms, and movements, all those forms of expression of art, are no more a spectacle offered to the contemplation of passive viewers. They have become actions. In a world where productive action, the action of men working with machines, is the leading core of collective life. So everything is movement, could be translated, everything is action. But, it's a strange type of action. An action performed by, by bodies that are only shadows, like the cameraman on the first poster, or are fragmented into parts, looking like the corpse of a machine, in the case of the female dance. So it turns out that it's not only a question of opposing the direct performance of the bodies to the shadows of the old stories of love and age. It's a question of destroying the organic model which sustained both the representative idea of visual beauty and the representative conception of the poetic brand. The point is that the representative regime of the art did not get its norm from the idea of imitation, 
we got them from a definite idea of action, linked with a definite idea of the organic body. Poetry, according to Aristotle, was not so much verse as it was fiction, a concatenation of events linked together by necessity or very similitude. As a consequence, a painting, a sculpture, or a ballet could be thought as art in the representative tradition if their combinations of forms could be seen as representing an action. But conversely, the, mo the narrative model of action was governed by the visual model of the body, the living whole composed by a living head and functional members all articulated with one another. But that's not the whole story. Action was not only a certain concatenation of events, it was also a form of life, the lot of a specific group of human beings. Action is not the mere fact of doing something, and passivity is not simply the fact of doing nothing or of being subjected to external activity. Action and passivities are categories in the distribution of the sense. Action is a category that draws a line of separation between two ways of doing and two classes of human beings. There are active men, men able to conceive great ends and to take the risk of pursuing them, and there are passive men, men enclosed in the circle of reproductive life, where any activity is only a mean for that reproduction. Those men had a name, the classical order, they were called mechanical men or mechanics, men only living in the sphere of the practical means aiming at immediate goals. Men whose bodies were distorted by the fact of being dedicated to immediate needs. The model for classic beauty could only be given by active men. Men whose free body lived in a sphere of ends that were no means for any end but themselves. Those active men were also called men of leisure, in opposition to the mechanical men. This is a key point about modern and modernist temporality. The issue of time is not simply about the old and the new, the fast and the slow. It's about the distribution of the sensible, about the quality of the form of life, because men of action and men of leisure did not live in the same time as the mechanical men. And <clears throat> such was the background of the representative regime, the background that we must have in mind if we want to understand what is at stake in the aesthetic revolution and in the politics of the aesthetic revolution. Such is the distribution of modes of doing and being that comes to be oriented down by the posters we are looking at. This is the film that they advertise and, of course, the conception of art that they emblematize. The destruction of the plot is not simply the opposition of direct performance to representation. It is a destruction of the organic model of action and of the whole distribution of the sensible to which it belongs. This is why the becoming political of art cannot be equated with its becoming active, with the transformation of the spectacle into action, as so many people still have it now. The opposition of action to the passivity of the spectator remains inside its own model. What describes this model is a dismissal of the opposition itself. It is what is done by the shift from action to movement. If movement is a medium within which words and visual forms become the same, it's not because movement simply means an urgent action. On the contrary, it is because movement means the destruction of the classical model of action and of the acting organic body. The body of the dancer here offers, um, offers a new paradigm of dynamism to the extent that it is a non-organic body. It is a body to which its fragmentation gives a twofold power. On the one hand, it's a body entirely devoted to its functional performance, but at the same time, it is an expression of the power which is superior to organism, which is life, the principle of all that moves and acts, of what dissolves the privileges of action into the equality of movement. This is also the point where the machine comes in. The performance of the human body on those two posters looks like the performance of the machine and conversely. The performance of the machine, the performance of the machine looks like the performance of the human eye. This, but this fusion of the body and the machine, and more widely, 
the role of the machine in so-called avant-garde art. As nothing to do, I think, with a naive admiration for technical novelty, speed, and ethics. It has to do with the destruction of the organic world. On the one hand, bodies are active, insofar as their fragmentation makes them work in the same way as the machines. But on the other hand, the machine is much more than the power of technique. It is the abolition of the opposition between men, men of ends and men of means. The machine doesn't know of such distinction. It doesn't know of the opposition between activity and passivity. The machine, and notably the machine producing moving images, is much more than a more exact and more powerful agent substituted for the human agent. The wedding of the dancing woman with the vision machine in the same movement achieves, in fact, an overall destruction of the hierarchical distribution of the sense. But it achieves it at the cost of some oddities, which are visible on our posters. Ecstatic as a dancer may look, it turns out that the very space of her manifestation is no space for real dancing. The shaded ground on which she is supposed to dance is turned into a skyscraper, skyscraper so that her dance becomes a flight or a fall seen from a reverse angle. The equivalence of the ground and the sky, the up and the down, denies the depth of the three-dimensional stage on which dancing bodies are used to draw their figures. So the acting body is not a body, and the space is no space, is no space for action. The dancing woman is in fact a combination of two bodies. The first one is an ecstatic body symbolizing an adhesion to holistic impulse of modern life. Not each incidentally, this woman with a pair of short hair, a ring and a high heel shoes, looks like an American free woman, more than a Soviet activist. But the, but the second one, the second body, is a mechanical body, a fragmental, a fragmented body. On the one end, the dancing machine is the immediate identity of work and danger. On the other end, it is a splintered body. The same goes with space. In a way, the space which both welcomes and rejects the dancer as an American space, at least. An American space as is green by modern Europe, a space entirely covered by modern skyscrapers. But the perspective within which the skyscrapers are represented, flying far from the old earth and proudly defying the sky, belongs to a space that breaks away from the normal representation of the third dimension on a two-dimensional surface. The main feature of that space is obliqueness. It is also a typical feature among Soviet avant-garde artists in the 1920s. Let us think, for instance, of Rochenko's photographs with their dramatic oblique high or low angles, of elicit ski crowns or of Tatrin's architectural projects such as the Lenin Tribune or the Monument to the Third International. The diagonal has even been theorized by Elisitsky as a special configuration well suited to the new communist age, in the same way as the sphere was to the classical order and the vertical to the Gothic. It constructs an egalitarian space which has abolished the very hierarchy of art and law, and at the same time an infinite space which can no more be embraced within the categories of our order. The infinite universe of the new life, or in a way space, become time. This is what accounts for the oddities of the representation. In our posters construct a modern time space, which tries to merge three things, artistic, anti-representative modernity, modern life, and communist revolution. But the identification cannot be direct. It has to be symbolized. It requires the weaving of a specific fabric, an aesthetic fabric, which unites the three terms. But it unites them as a performance of a splintered body in an impossible space, a space made of time, made of a time which is ahead of itself in a way. This makes for the world split, a split of the moving body and a split in the time of its performance. Well, let us examine them in turn. The first problem is about that movement, 
whose temporality is opposed to that of meditative action. How are we to characterize this movement itself? What the violinist body and the mechanical body share in common, it was opposed most of them to the model of action. Action means the pursuit of definite ends through applicated means. Movement just means a sequence of acts, irrespective of the ends to which it is subordinated. In that sense, movement is both what serves action and what neutralizes it. It is the absence of end or the inaction, which is at the service of action and can be made autonomous apart from action and possibly against it. The issue of that inactive action is not something new in the 1920s. It was from the very beginning at the core of the polemics which initiated the collapse of the representative model in the 18th century. Let us think of the 18th century polemics about the theatrical action and its effects. Around, around 1760, this model came in for two types of criticism that can be epitomized by two books, and sorry for I'm sorry to French books. No, 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 the French book and the Swiss book. Diderot's conversation of the natural soul and Rousseau's letter of the spectators. Diderot criticized the two main aspects of the theatrical convention, the contrived cleverness of the plots with the art of theater, and the conventions of noble language, and contraposed to it the reality of situations in ordinary life, and the multifarious gestures and attitudes and even silences which express the truth of feeling and the intensity of emotion in real life. So the conventional circular action and the conventional tones and attitudes of the actor are to be replaced by the language of the body, the language of corporal signs. The key word of that critique was the word expression. A few years later, Rousseau's letter to Dalembert on the spectacle focused on the effects of the dramatic performance. In spite of pretense, theater say teaches nothing. The only feeling that it produces is a passion for the theater, for theater itself. That is a passion for shadows, for a shadow of happiness, for which the spectators give up the pursuit of happiness in real life. This is why he opposed to the false lessons of morality of the theater, the collective energy given to the Spartan citizens in the antiquity by their songs and dances, or the sense of community and possibly conveyed by the Swiss popular festivals. Those two critics are at the same target, the artificiality of the theatrical action and the lie of its supposed effect on society. Both oppose to the appearances of action, the direct expression of life. Now that expression of life was split from the beginning, on the one side, it was a new form of spectacle. What Diderot and the reformers of the theatre in his time could paint against the mimetic order was a form of hypermimesis, a language of the body, which is still a language of multiple <coughs> signs, supposing an overall correspondence between the feelings of the souls and the traits, gestures, and attitudes able to express it. So, on that side, life meant the subjugation of movement. To the to language of science. On the other hand, with Rousseau, the festival replaced the theater as the expression of life. But that entire absorption of the spectacle into collective action meant a return from the representative order to the ethical order. It was staged the platonic opposition between the theatrical line and the authenticity of the choreographic performance in which the gestures of the citizens imitate the very principles and collective virtue. None of those two forms of expression of life could really break the old image of action. What could break it was a form of movement capable of abolishing the hierarchy inherent in both action and inaction, the hierarchy opposing active men to passive men, and that opposing men of leisure to those men who only need alternation of work and rest. Strength as it might seem, Expressive life are to be contaminated by powers of inexpressiveness and inaction. And it is that contamination that is witnessed by the performance of the vitalist and mechanical dancer 
on our principles. I think it's worth examining, examining shortly the genealogy of that contamination. In the same time, I did Rowan Rousseau proposed expressive life for theatrical action. Winkelmann proposed its paradoxical analysis of the statue known as the Torso of the Envelope, a statue of Hercules deprived of the arms and legs necessary for achieving his labors. This Hercules, he said, is only pondering on his past and his past deeds, but as he has no, as he has no head for pondering, his coat is only expressed by the curve of his back and the muscle of the torso, whose forms are engulfed by one another in a continuous movement, movement similar to the indifferent rise and fall of the waves. This indifferent rise and fall of the wave-like muscle entails a new idea of movement, an idea of movement which neutralizes the very opposition of movement and rest. That identity of movement and stillness got a name. It, it was called a free movement. A movement which is not fettered by the obligation to perform actions or express emotion. But this idea of free movement implied a new idea of the body, of its life and of its movement that 20th century dancers and performers set out to revive by looking at Greek vases of sculpture. What makes the body living is no more the organic link of action in which limbs obey the head. <clears throat> the free movement is a movement that has no end in the two senses of the word. First, it never begins, nor does it ever end. Next, it has no goal. It is this endlessness that makes the wave-like undulation of the torso of the better embodied with freedom than the parents of the human pattern effects. Thirty years after Winkelmann Schiller, made the idea of freedom expressed by the statue both more explicit and more problematic as it turns the identity of movement and immobility into an identity of action and image. <coughs> what he calls the play drive is not so much a specific type of movement as it is a specific form of experience. A form of experience in which the subject is no more determined to enact a specific capacity to respond to specific impulse, need, or interest, as, as happens with ordinary forms of experience. Aesthetic freedom of is experience of a capacity of indetermination, the experience of a capacity which can be shared by anybody, as it dismisses the practical oppositions that structure both action and inaction. <clears throat> that which shines in the face of the great deity, she would say, is his idleness, the absence of any care of where. They are the characteristics of aesthetic experience in which the usual hierarchy of the sensible experience are suspended. Aesthetic freedom versus freedom from the power of the will, and notably from the will to use art in order to produce effects on individuals and collectives. Well, we can now go back to our process. What appears on, on their impossible surface is not only the passage from representation to direct performance, nor is it the only wedding of the human body with the machine. It is a new configuration of space and time, in which the very activity of men and women is identical with the indifference of the free movement and the inactivity of play expressing collective freedom. This combination of divine indifference with the energy of the construction of the new communist life may look strange. But we must not forget that communist life itself meant two things. For those who were at the head of the communist party and of the Soviet state, communism was the form of collective light that would result from the success of the plans of development of industrialization and collective. It would be the result of science, hard labor, and discipline. In short, <coughs> communism for them was a matter of ends and means. But before being the goal to be reached, communism is an aesthetic idea. The idea of a form of sensible experience within which precisely the hierarchical separation transforming the human activity into a simple means in the service of external ends has been accomplished. It is the idea of communism that the young mass 
had expressed in some famous text, an idea that was clearly an aesthetic idea inherited from Schiller and from his romantic readers. The idea of a form of community in which the idea of human essence is no more separated from the concrete lives of the individuals. As long as communism is posited as a goal to be reached through the right adjustment of ends and means, it remains inside the old representative and hierarchical current. In order to be reached at all, communism has to exist already as a form of sensible experience. This is an anticipation of the future, which has not much to do with its usual idea of avant-garde. The point is not to be ahead of one's time or ahead of the crowd who are driving them and driving them ahead. No. The point is to put temporalities in one and the same time. The temporality of ends and means and the temporality between which ends and means have become indistinct. This is the way we can translate the famous project of union between the French heart and the German head. You know, in, in, in Marx, in the text of the young Marx, so, so the French temporality of action and the German temporality in which action has absorbed the, move, the moment of inaction. As you Marx perceived it, modernity is not the way of contemporaneousness, nor is it the disenchanted time of the loss of common beliefs and values. No. It is the time of the disjunction of temporalities. And what he calls the task of the present is the task of filling the gap between the temporalities. Now, there is, I think, an interesting convergence for the, like at first sight, a strange convergence about that distinct disjunction and about the reconciliation of the disjunctive temporality. Just as the young Marx made this statement, a very similar diagnosis was made on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean by an older disciple of German ideality, Amin Emerson, in his lecture on the poet. In the same way as Marx, Emerson affirmed that what modern humanity needed for the resumption of its sin was a new confession. The new confession, he said, is the task of the poet. The poet to come is the one who will find in the apparent triviality of the new American world in what he called the barbarism and materialism of the times <coughs> and overcoming all of the same gods whose pictures he so much admires in others. So the task of that poet is to give their spiritual meaning of symbols of common life to the display of prosaic objects and the network of mundane activities. As is well known, the first person who proposed himself to play the part of the poet to come, predicted by Emerson, was Walt Whitman. And I, I, I remind you that he did it by giving to all prosaic activities the most imaginable link, the suspension points which link the sentence of leaves of grass in the first edition. Leaves of grass, a book we must remember, but has, no, but has neither a beginning nor an end. Now, my point is that by defining the task of the poet, Emerson might well have formulated the most accurate statement of what modernity and modernism mean. The task that he gave to his poet is a task that so-called avant-garde artists set out to fulfill. The anticipation of the life to come, the construction of a sensorium in which the old divisions have already been abolished, in which all activities are equal and express the same spirit of community, a spirit which is present in the same way in the power of the useful machines and in the cheerful manifestation of vitality of a dancing woman, a spirit of endless movement. It is this endless movement that the Avatar's manual movie camera sets out to display. The film tells no story. It only connects activities. Those activities that are performed every day in the streets, the shop, the factories, the offices, the stadiums, or the workers' clubs. Filming is not a way of representing those actions. It is an action that creates a link between all those actions and organizes them into a film scene which is itself part of the construction of the new life. In that sense, the montage is the exact equivalent of Whitman's suspension points. It draws the spiritual thread 
which is the communist song of all those activities. Its main operation consists in rendering all of them equal. This means three things. First, making them equally important. Next, fragmenting them in very short pieces. And finally, editing them according to an accelerated reason. The machine of the operator and that of the editor make all those fragmented activities, the expression of the new collective life, characterized by the instantaneous connection of all movements. In such a way, the assembly line in the factory and the work given by a short shiner on the street, the work of the miner and the doing of nails in the beauty hour, are represented as equivalent manifestations of energy. But this overall connection has a condition. The condition is that each of those actions be disconnected from its own temporality, disconnected from the end that it pursues. The detractors of Virgil have already made the point about his earlier films. These machines compose an impressive century of movement, but nobody knew how they function and what they produce. This is the point. Virgil doesn't represent communism as a result of a plan, of a planned organization and hierarchy of tasks. He creates communism as the common rhythm of all activities. Now, this common rhythm supposes that all those performances share the same characteristic, unwillingness. This equal intensity makes productive work and free identity. But that identity can only be achieved in the space of play. This is what is illustrated by the last part of the film, in which we meet again the dancer and the tripod, and that we see that we saw on the posters. So I would like us to see, to look at, oh, well, we can, we can uh, switch from, and from this to, uh, we can find the film.
efforts of cinema. There is the performance of the employees in the telephone exchange, ceaselessly plugging it and unplugging, which is a metaphor of the filmic action as an interconnection of actions. But <clears throat> we have seen before the condition of that interconnection, which is that all the actions are split up into fragments appearing and disappearing at the same aspect of speed. This is why the tripod and the camera provide us with a very different image of the machine. They are turned into automats, bowing to the audience, before making the demonstration of the actions. So, on the one hand, the cameraman is only the employee of the telephone exchange, connecting every activity with all other activities. But on the other hand, he is a magician that turns all of them into tricks. But the coincidence of work and play must be shown in a space which is itself a space for play. So this movie theater, where, so where the film is, project, is supposed to be projected you know, in the evening, and where and the spectators, you know, and, and the spectators, you know, in this sequence are, are supposed to recognize themselves and they laugh at the spectacle of the frantic acceleration of their daily activities, which means, in a sense, that they play with the idea that those activities as implementation of the communist eye, or in an overturn, they play with the idea that they are, that they are paying communists. Not surprisingly, the builders of real and effective communism dislike both metaphors, the metaphor of connection and the metaphor of the message. And they revert against the filmmaker two accusations. On the one hand, with manism or pantheism, which meant for them the fascination with the ceaseless flow of reality. On the other hand, the second accusation, formalism, which meant for them the pursuit of art for art's sake. Both accusations amount to the same, <coughs> or at least to, uh, to, to, to the same basis. What is common to the Whitmanian or the Kanyanism and to formalist play is that both make will and unwillingness equivalent. But, and that equivalence might well have been the core of the aesthetic revolution and of its two main offsprings, artistic modernism and communism. That alliance, of course, was unacceptable for the constructors of real communism. Consequently, the urge Soviet filmmakers to give up, and Soviet artists in general, to give up to, to, to give up the pretension of constructing communism, of weaving the sensible forms of a new community. No, <clears throat> there could be only one temporality, the temporality of ends and means, which was also the temporality of work and rest. What Soviet artists had to do, so the party decided, was to serve the strategy of the Communist Party by representing the efforts and the problems of the real people and also by recreating, recreating them after the pains of their labor. In the other, in other terms, they had to go back to the representative model in which artists offer, offer to a determined class of people a determined combination of pleasure and education. That first repression of the communist project by the communist state paved the way to the second one. Its theoretical alliteration by Marxist intellectuals, who erase its, histori its, its historical existence and reinvented modernism as the utilization of high art, breaking the way from cultural industry to commit itself to the sole exploration of its media. I think it could be time, it could be interesting to, to revisit the old story. Thank you.